The purpose of this video is to go through the practice problem from this one-way analysis of variance document that you should have read through already and tried to understand the steps. And hopefully you've tried to work through that practice problem yourself first, and now you're watching the video to just check your work. Or if you got stuck somewhere, you can watch the video to see where you got stuck and, and figure out what you need to do next. Now, if you would like to see a video that explains what the analysis of variance test is, or the ANOVA test, there is a second video called Analysis of Variance Explained, and Dr. Strode does a nice job during that video. So you have two resources here. But for this one, I'm going to skip through the explanation, because you can watch an explanation in the other video. And I'm going to go all the way down here to the practice problem, but we're going to have to come back and check the directions in order to make sure we're doing all the steps correctly. So here's the problem. A student observed that just after bean plants germinate, their cotyledons slowly shrivel. A cotyledon is a leaf that is produced by a plant when it first germinates. So sometimes they produce two cotyledons, sometimes they produce one cotyledon, Bean plants produce two cotyledons. So she hypothesized that the young plants are using energy from their cotyledons to fuel extra growth and predicted that bean plants with either one or both cotyledons removed just after germination would be shorter after three weeks relative to bean plants with their cotyledons intact. So the first question says, what is the null statistical hypothesis for this experiment? So let's look at her data here. So here are heights of bean plants with either zero, one, or two cotyledons removed. So this group had no cotyledons removed, this one had one cotyledon removed, and this group had both cotyledons removed three weeks after germination. So the null hypothesis would be that this mean is equal to this mean and is equal to this mean, that there are no statistical differences between the means that are calculated, which we haven't done that calculation yet. So now number two says to perform the ANOVA on the student's data to test the null hypothesis. So we have to follow the steps that were given in this sample problem. So first, we're going to determine the treatment totals, the treatment means, the grand total, and the grand mean. So coming back to our data. So here, I've calculated a total of 87.3, just adding all these up, 78.5, adding all these up, and 57.1. The means are 9.7, 8.7, and 6.3. Hopefully you got these numbers or something close to it. So here are the treatment totals that were calculated here. Here are the treatment means. And then in order to calculate the grand total for all scores, then we take those three totals and I got 222.9. And then the grand mean would be taking that number and dividing by all of the samples, which was 27. So let's come back and look at our instructions again. Okay, now we need to determine the degrees of freedom. Now we have talked about degrees of freedom before. So if you remember, degrees of freedom are calculated by taking the number in that group and subtracting one from it. And so to calculate the degrees of freedom between the groups, we take the number of groups, in this case there's three groups, and we subtract one from it. So three minus one is two. To calculate the degrees of freedom within our groups, now here we have to count up each of the separate measurements within these groups. And so there are nine in this group, and nine minus one is eight, and there are nine in this group, so nine minus one again would be eight, and nine in this group, and nine minus one a third time would be eight. So eight times three, because there were three groups, each with nine measurements in each group, gives us degrees of freedom within of 24. Okay, so let's go back to the instructions again. 
Okay, so once we've determined our degrees of freedom, now we have to determine this value that's called the sum of squares total. And we can do this in three steps. So the first step is to square each value of each of those measurements that were collected and then take the sum of all of those. And that gives us our sum of squares. So let's go ahead and look at what that looks like. So in this table here, I have each of the values for the zero cotyledon group, each of the values for the one cotyledon group, and then each of the values for the two cotyledon group. And all I've done is squared them. So here's the square of this one, here's the square of this one, and then I've added all those up. And here's my SS is 1930.75. Next, we take the grand total which we've already calculated, and we divide it by the total number of observations. So that's the total number of measurements that we made. So our grand total, remember, was 222.9, and our total number of observations was 27. And so I'm going to take that 229 and square it and divide by 27. And if I do this, I get 1,840.16. Finally, we subtract the answer in B here from the answer in A. So we take this number and we subtract it from that SS value. So if we do that, I subtracted 1,840.16 from 1,930.75. So my sum of squares total came out to be 90.59. So step four says to determine the sum of squares within the groups. So in order to do this, we sum the squares of the difference of each score from its group mean, or sometimes we call that the treatment mean. And then we're going to square the quantity of each score minus its own column mean. And then we're going to sum the values for all the subjects in the experiment. So let's go see what that looks like. So this step here should look a lot like when we practice calculating variance when we were first learning how to do the t-test. And so here's the mean for this treatment group was 9.7, and here was the first measurement. So if I take the difference between 10.3 and 9.7 and I square it, then I get 0.36. And so I did that for all of these. I did the same thing over here, but Instead of comparing it to 9.7, I was comparing this group to a mean of 8.7 because its group had a different mean. So I did this for all three groups, and then I added them up for all three groups. So 13.66, 12.26, 11.08. So it's also important to remember what the purpose of doing these calculations are. So what we're determining here, these are our sum of squares within. So what we want to know is how different are each of these measurements from the mean that's supposed to be representing them. Because if there's a lot of differences, then that will affect how confident we can be in our results. That will affect how statistically different the different groups are from each other. If there are fewer differences, if we ended up with a smaller sum of squares within, then that might indicate that there's a larger difference between the groups that we're comparing. All right, so let's go back and look at the instructions again. So after I've calculated my SS within, and since we've already calculated our SS total, we can calculate our SS between by just taking the difference between them. So that's a simple calculation. Oh, by the way, my calculation for the SS within was 37, if I added those all up. So the SS between is taking the difference between the SS total and the SS within. And if you do this, you should get something pretty close to 53.59. We are almost done. So those are our main calculations that require a lot of steps. So ultimately, we want to calculate one number, and that one number will represent two things. It'll tell us how different are the means from each other, and how many differences are there within those groups. So first, we're going to determine our mean square between. So that's also kind of known as the average square between. And then our mean or average square within 
And we take these two numbers that we just calculated, our SS between and our SS within, and we just divide by degrees of freedom between or degrees of freedom within. In this sample calculation here, the mean square between is a pretty big number, which means that there were some pretty big differences between the mean of group one and the mean of group two and the mean of group three, and that the mean square within is a pretty small number, meaning that there were very few differences within. And so when you take this number and divide by this number, which is what we do to determine our F ratio, if you start with a big mean square between and a very small mean square within, then you end up with a very large F ratio. So let's see what our F ratio would be based on our calculations here. So if we divide our mean square between, which was 26.8, by our mean square within, which was 1.54, and notice here that this is a pretty large number and this is a pretty small number, then we get an F ratio, or an F observed value of 17.40. And so now we just have to go find the place in the, the table where we can identify our critical value. So remember, in order to determine our critical value, we have to know our alpha value first. And remember, the alpha value is the rejection level, right? That's the level at which we can say, as long as there is no more than this percent chance of the null hypothesis being true, then we are comfortable with saying that the differences observed were true differences and couldn't have just occurred randomly or accidentally. And so in our case, our alpha level is 0.05. So if we go to our table of critical values, in the ANOVA test, we have to take into consideration our degrees of freedom between the treatments in addition to our degrees of freedom within the treatments. Now remember with the t-test, we only had two groups. And so our degrees of freedom between would have always been one. In this case, we have three groups, and so our degrees of freedom between is two. And if you remember, we calculated our degrees of freedom within to be 24, because it was eight plus eight plus eight. So if I'm in the second column here and I come down to 24, my critical value is 3.40. So my observed F value was calculated to be 17.40. And this is just like interpreting a t-test, where we compared our t-observed to our t-crit. If the value is larger than the critical value, which in this case was 3.40, then this means we can reject the null hypothesis. And we can say that there is a significant difference between the mean height of the plants with zero, one, or two cotyledons removed just after germination. So I hope that going through these calculations helped you. One last thing that we need to do is plug in our values into an ANOVA table. And so here were all the values that we calculated earlier the treatment totals and the means, grand mean, grand total. And then here I've taken the sum of squares total, which we calculated, the sum of squares between and within, the degrees of freedom between and within and total, the mean square between and within, the F value that we calculated and the F critical value that we looked up in the table. Now, if you were to use a program like Microsoft Excel or some sort of other program that you find online to do these calculations for you, then you would also get a p-value. In this case, our p-value is really, really, really tiny. This makes sense because our F value is much bigger than our F critical value. And so that means there's a very, very, very tiny chance, a very, very small probability that the differences that we observed were due to just chance alone or that the null hypothesis was true. So one last thing to show you is how to do these calculations using Microsoft Excel. So here I've plugged in all my values into an Excel spreadsheet. And your version of Excel might be different from mine. and um, you may or may not have this feature, and feel free to come see us if you want to see if your Excel program has this data analysis feature that mine does. But I go up to data, I go to data analysis, and I find analysis of variance. Single factor is what we're doing here. And what's nice about this is I can just 
highlight the entire group. And since I want my labels to be there, I'm going to click Labels in first row. My alpha is already set at 0.05. If I don't click Output Range here, then it'll open up my table in a different page, but I like everything to be on the same sheet. So I'm going to click right here, and that'll be where my table goes. When I click OK, it gives me my ANOVA table, which we just filled in ourselves, but here it's giving me all the information again. So that's how to do it in Microsoft Excel, and there are other programs that can do these calculations for you in addition to your graphing calculators, and I have some instructions to share with you for that as well, which will be posted online.